Thank you all for joining us for IRP's uh, Thursday seminar, still coming to you in a virtual way. Um, we're delighted to have with us today Eva Rosen, who's from the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown. Um, and Eva is, uh, if you will, rounding out, we've had a number of speakers recently on housing. So we're super excited to continue to take a deep dive and learn more about housing policy and its intersection with poverty. Um, and Eva is going to talk to us today about some of her work related to Section 8 vouchers. Um, so we're very excited. And with that, I'll turn it over to her. Oh, but first, um, she said she was happy to take questions as she goes. Um, so the way in which you would be able to ask her a question is to go ahead and use the Q&A function. Um, and then I will, as appropriate, interrupt and um, ask her your question. So please use the Q&A as we go uh, to filter in questions. And with that, I will turn it over to Eva. Thanks, Eva. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and thank you all for coming today. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, and I really look forward to, um, to your questions and comments. Please do feel free to, to jump in at any time. I'm gonna share my screen now and I usually can't see anything other than my screen once I do that. So um, I will rely on Catherine to jump in um, if folks have questions while I'm presenting. Okay, hopefully you all see um, the first slide here, which um, is a picture of the book that um, I came out with this summer um, related to my research on housing vouchers in Baltimore um, and housing the poor more broadly in this country. Um, I'm just gonna verify before I say anything else. Do you see the second slide here with the, with the red brick building? Yes, we do. Excellent, awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Um, a central tenet of urban sociology is that place matters, that where you live shapes who you are and what you become. And uh, one of my mentors, William Julius Wilson, in the 1980s proposed that the effects of being poor come not just from how much money you and your family have, but of course also from the poverty in the neighborhood around you. And this proposition fueled a whole subfield of research that we call the neighborhood effects, considering how the neighborhood environment shapes the social world of its inhabitants through things like social networks, job opportunities, schools, crime, and racial segregation. And um, less attention though has been paid to a key mechanism through which poverty affects individuals. And that is uh, housing, which I gather you guys have been hearing a lot about lately. So in the past two decades, there's been a transformation in American housing policy. And I study a neighborhood in Baltimore where poor families have moved in large numbers with a growing form of federal housing assistance, housing vouchers. And in the past, uh, there's a repeat slide, housing vouchers, there we go. So in the 70s, under the Nixon administration, vouchers were created and they were thought to be an economically efficient tool to use existing private housing stock to provide homes for the poor. In the 90s, the program was expanded to house the hundreds of thousands of people who were put out when public housing was torn down. And as high rises were demolished across the country, we really ushered in a new era of federal aid. One that relies on the private market to provide homes for poor families. And while it was not an official goal of the program, many have come to hope that it might also provide the opportunity for families to move to new neighborhoods. Now, while the program has been shown to be a key anti-poverty tool, it has been less successful at helping families achieve mobility. And the book I'll tell you about today is what I call an ethnography of a policy. It explores housing vouchers, what they were originally meant to do, what policymakers have come to hope that they can do, and also what they actually do and don't do. Now with this research, I am attempting to bring the physical nature of housing, the markets that govern it, as well as the social relationships to which housing structures give rise back into the study of neighborhoods. And of course we are embedded not just in our neighborhoods but also in our homes. And to this end, the role of landlords as I'll talk about a little bit later on in the lives of poor Americans remains largely understudied. In this way, housing conditions are not just an outcome of poverty but also a cause. 
Now, I want to set up this story about vouchers with just a bit of context. When we think about the history of housing policy, we can think about three eras in which it has unfolded. The first era is the tenement slums of cities like New York and Chicago, where immigrants settled and later black migrants from the South during the Great Migration. In the 30s, urban renewal raised the slums and public housing was created. High rises were built across the country. They were intended to literally lift the poor out of poverty by providing safe, clean homes with modern amenities like running water and elevators. In the second era, buildings like Cabrini Green in Chicago, Lafayette Courts in Baltimore shown here, they were meant to alleviate slum poverty, but they ended up helping to concentrate it in neighborhoods that were racially segregated, often with high crime and few resources. This is what Arnold Hirsch, of course, famously called the second ghetto, implicating federal housing policies as complicit in the perpetuation of racial segregation and inequality. Wilson's seminal work, The Truly Disadvantaged, documented macroeconomic changes that gave birth to a new urban underclass. As manufacturing left the inner city, he showed, so too did the jobs and the middle class, creating a new sort of geographic and social isolation, more concentrated than ever before, and with profound effects for social networks, jobs, educational attainment. From redlining and racial covenants to separate and unequal public housing rosters, discrimination in housing practices persisted throughout this era, even well after some forms were outlawed in the Fair Housing Act and in the courts. These formal and informal practices played a pivotal role in sorting people across the urban landscape by race. Furthermore, several, several prominent lawsuits found the location of public housing to contribute to racial segregation in violation of the Fair Housing Act. In the 90s, these lawsuits, bolstered by theories of concentrated poverty and social isolation, set the stage for a huge overhaul of federal housing policy. <clears throat> In the following years, we witnessed the dismantling of an entire system of housing the poor. The secretary of HUD proposed reforms that would, in his words, end public housing as we know it. And over the last three decades, blighted public housing has been downsized and demolished across the country. Of course, public housing still exists, but there's really been a huge shift in how housing assistance is administered overall and in what direction we're moving in. <clears throat> In its wake, we're entering a third housing regime, one where high-rise demolition and transition to housing the poor in the private market have really become cornerstones of the government's quest to fight concentrated poverty. By the late 90s, vouchers became the largest housing assistance program in the country, serving over 2.2 million households. Now, how do vouchers work? For those of you who don't know, the voucher subsidizes the cost of a unit in the private market, allowing families to access homes they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. So families pay 30% of their income in rent, the government pays the rest directly to the landlord. Specifically, it comes through the local public housing authority. Now, rent ceilings are based on fair market rent in Baltimore, that's around $1,300 for a two bedroom. And anyone earning under a certain income threshold is eligible. But importantly, only one in four families who qualify receives any form of housing assistance. In Baltimore, for example, the wait list is longer than the people who actually receive aid. It's so long that it's usually closed. Now nationwide, 45% of housing voucher holders are black. In Baltimore, 94% are black um, and 35% are white nationwide. In 1998, the Section 8 program was renamed the Housing Choice Voucher Program, reflecting the importance of promoting geographic opportunity through residential choice. Housing vouchers are hoped to create opportunities for families to move out of distressed neighborhoods into homes of their choosing, neighborhoods that might be safer with better schools and more jobs. But the big question, of course, is do they? And when we look at where voucher holders live, there has been some improvement. So voucher holders today live in less poor neighborhoods than in the kinds of neighborhoods where public housing used to be located. And they are somewhat less likely to live in neighborhoods of extreme poverty compared to those who don't receive any assistance at all. 
But by and large, many voucher holders are not moving to areas of opportunity and many still live in poor neighborhoods. In addition, there are important differences by race. Black voucher holders live in highly segregated neighborhoods and minorities in general are half as likely as whites to make it to, low, to a low poverty neighborhood with their voucher. What this research can't tell us though, is how people decide where to live, what role the voucher plays in this decision and what constrains those choices. So there were a few big questions that really remained unanswered for me that helped to motivate this project. The first is, where do people want to live and why do they end up where they do? And existing research illuminates all kinds of preferences that people may have about where they live related to geography, race, social networks, the role that discrimination plays. But I felt we had more to learn about what choice actually looks like for voucher holders within a set of constraints. So what kinds of factors get in the way of these preferences? And I also wondered how to think about the underlying theory that moving nearer to higher income neighborhoods really helps people. In other words, how are voucher holders actually received by their new neighbors? What kind of role might stigma around the policy play? And more broadly, I wondered whether we should actually expect that a market-based program would produce different outcomes than the broader housing market already does. Eva? Yeah, um, we have one uh, question, which is um, Lois, who is a great GRF, you might have met an hour ago, uh, asks how families move from the waiting list to get a voucher. Is it lottery or is it um, some other mechanism over time? And I want to remind uh, seminar participants who are listening to put their questions not in the chat, but in the Q&A, please. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, great question, Lois. Um, it is a lottery, but it's not hundred percent. I mean, it's a, it's a lottery that has preferences. Let's put it that way. So local PHAs can decide that certain groups get priority. For example, um, persons experiencing homelessness, people who have uh, experienced domestic violence, um, different kinds of um, families with children or elderly. These are all sort of different groups that local PHAs can weight differently, but in essence, yes, it is a lottery. Um, and so many of, of the people that I spoke to and got to know um, knew it was, I mean, they knew it was a lottery and also it felt like the lottery when they actually got off the waiting list, which can take years and years. Um, they felt like they were actually winning the lottery. So we'll talk more about that. So in order to look at these questions, I moved to a Baltimore neighborhood called Park Heights to learn more about how this policy really worked for people on the ground. And I selected this neighborhood by using HUD data to look at where voucher holders tend to live in Baltimore, as you can see on the map here. Now, uh, and, and this map is not adjusted for, for population density. So um, uh, overall, Baltimore has one of the highest voucher rates for large cities in the US. In the neighborhood I study, which is outlined here in red, Park Heights, it's even higher. So in this neighborhood, nearly 17% of rentals are occupied by voucher holders. And a third of the residents here are poor and the neighborhood is 96% black. I moved to the neighborhood in 2011 and I did field work there for about 15 months using a combination of ethnographic observations and in-depth interviews. To find participants, I began by sampling addresses from the website where the Housing Authority directs all voucher holders to find homes. This is called gosection8.com. And then I went door to door in the neighborhood to actually try to find them. So I eventually got to know residents and their friends, their families, their neighbors. I went on, I attended family dinners, church on Sunday, tagged along for daily errands and especially accompanied families on housing searches. Now I wanted to identify all of the different actors who were relevant to the question I was interested in. And so I studied four different groups, the aging homeowners who bought their homes in the 1960s, the more recent influx of voucher holders, um, as well as the unassisted renters who received no help from the government and finally, I also ended up including the landlords who house these renters. I talked to everyone in all of these groups about how they came to the neighborhood, where they had lived previously, learning about in-depth life histories with all 102 respondents. <coughs> so I wanna give you a sense of the physical landscape of the neighborhood. This picture shows one of the main streets lined with these really spacious homes. You can see some board ups here. 
And one quarter of homes in the neighborhood are vacant. But as you can see, in some areas, there are really more vacant homes than occupied ones. Park Heights has one of the highest um, vacancy rates in the city. But I will point your attention to the left-hand side of the screen where you can see that while this block appears to be mostly uninhabited, we have this one home over on the left, actually it might be on the right for you if it's mirroring, I'm not sure. But on one side of the screen, you should see a, um, a house with flower pots um, on the, on the on the porch window still there, um, indicating that you've got this one family living on this essentially vacant block. Eva, one more question. I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt your flow. Um, <laughs> Elise asked, once they, have, at least you get a, a chance to have a sip of water. <laughs> um, once they obtain yeah. vouchers, do holders continue to struggle to pay rent? How often do they end up being ejected from the program and are evicted from their housing for not being able to pay rent? Yeah, that's a great question. It, it can still sometimes be hard to pay rent. In theory, if a family is paying 30% of their income, if they have no income, then they're paying almost no money. So in theory, um, they should be able to, to keep up um, with uh, the rent that they owe. But as you can imagine, there are definitely times when that's not true. Um, I don't have statistics on how often voucher holders are evicted. This is actually something I'm working on now um, in DC. But um, as, as you all are probably aware, um, you know, the, the data on eviction is only very recently sort of becoming um, more widely available um, and more usable. And so um, I, I have a actually proposal into HUD to try to match the voucher data with the eviction data, but it's, it's all, um, you have to use real names to do this. So it's, it's really confidential and sensitive. Um, so that, that would be something great to study. I think um, more often than not, where you see the problem coming in is in voucher holders unable to actually find a home to rent with their voucher. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but certainly I, I would not be surprised to see some higher than expected numbers around eviction as well. So the neighborhood, as you can see in this photo, um, is really peppered with these gaping holes where homes have been torn down, trees and grass have kind of begun to invade the urban space. And I wanna just take you back a little bit so you can understand the history of the neighborhood. Um, in 1969, this photo here is the Park Heights that Terrence Green, who's one of the older homeowners I got to know, this is the Park Heights that he found when he bought a home here with his wife. And at that time, it was a tree-lined neighborhood where mostly middle-class white families lived. Due to a long history of racial covenants and redlining, African-American families were not allowed to move just anywhere in Baltimore, like in most of this country. And in the late 60s, for the first time, banks became willing to lend money to Black home buyers in neighborhoods like Park Heights. So back, back then, Mr. Green said to me, back then, Park Heights in 1960, when I bought this house, everybody in this whole area was white. There were no Black people. In fact, the neighborhood was predominantly Jewish, which was a selling point for Mr. Green, who loved the deli around the corner. And he put what happened next in really simple terms for me. He said, let me explain that to you, sweetheart. In those days, any time a black person would buy a house, all the Jewish people would leave. This is a story we're all familiar with, of course. And in the 60s, in a practice known as block busting, which many credit Baltimore um, as inventing, um, at that time, real estate agents would stoke fears of Black incursion in neighborhoods like Park Heights by flipping white-owned homes one at a time. And as the Black family moved in, the white families moved out. Mr. Green says he doesn't harbor any animosity towards the white families who left. He says they did what they felt they had to. And you know something, they weren't wrong. They knew things were changing because now we're all stuck here with homes that ain't worth nothing. Now in 1960, Park Heights was 95% white and primarily middle class. And in the span of just a decade, this community of 20,000 people was replaced almost entirely. So by 2010, it was 96% black. Over the years, the neighborhood has been hit hard with economic troubles, including joblessness and an aging housing stock. Park Heights now has one of the higher violent crime rates in Baltimore and is known as the heroin capital of the city. So to tell you a little bit about what I found. In the first few chapters of the book, 
to really examine what the program is meant to do officially and unofficially and how these goals actually play out on the ground for voucher recipients. So on the one hand, vouchers are meant to provide stable housing and research shows they do this quite well. The program improves housing affordability, it reduces homelessness, it's been shown to alleviate overcrowding. In chapter two, I tell the stories of the folks who don't receive any housing assistance, and it's quite clear how much worse off they are than the ones who do. So Destiny Stevens, one of the women's I got to know, women I got to know, and these are all pseudonyms, I should say. Destiny lives in a room for rent. She shares the room with her husband and two children. She carries her own roll of toilet paper to the bathroom every day, multiple times a day. Um, the bathroom that she shares with the three other adults who live in the house. <clears throat> and she's been on the voucher waiting list for several years. Um, this is what's called uh, a room for rent, as I mentioned. And so um, the couple pays about $600 in rent um, and with all four um, uh, adult renters in the house, uh, right? The landlord is earning quite a bit more than he could earn if he was renting that house out to one family. Um, there's also Tina Jackson who moved to the to Park Heights with her 13 year old when she lost her home in East Baltimore um, that she owned, but she could not affair, afford to repair the roof. And now Tina and her daughter share a two bedroom apartment um, in a complex called Oakland Terrace. Um, which is uh, quite dangerous and Tina is afraid to go outside. She's also been on the Section 8 wait list for years. Now in chapter three, I tell the stories of several people who were lucky enough to receive a housing voucher and the ways in which it changed their lives for the better. So people describe this, as I said, like winning the lottery, which quite tangibly it actually is. Vivian Warner was able to move off her sister's couch. She had been previously homeless and she regained custody of her twin boys because she now had a place to live. Uh, Tony Young was a 55-year-old 50, man with HIV who was able to move out from under the bridge where he had been sleeping into a one-bedroom apartment with heat and electricity. And with this stability, he was able to take his meds more regularly um, and stay a lot healthier. Joanne Jones was a mother of two. She was able to start shopping at the National Food Store where she could buy fresh fruit and veggies for her kids. So one of the big um, findings that the quantitative research shows is that when people get a voucher, they spend more money on food with that extra money that they have. Um, they actually buy more food and buy higher quality food. Um, however, many policymakers, of course, have also come to hold a secondary hope for the program, that it provides uh, choice and gets people to new neighborhoods. So, uh, so, and gets people to new neighborhoods to create mobility. Um, that said, it's not doing so well on the second one, um, as I'll talk more about. And in chapter four, um, I tell a story from my field work that helps to illustrate this. So one of the women I met in Park Heights, her name was Edie Baxter. She's in her 50s. She was born in public housing, in the flag homes, and she moved out when she was a teen, bounced around to a lot of different homes, many of them poor quality, many of them in dangerous neighborhoods. Um, she got off the Section 8 wait list when she was pregnant with her first daughter. And sorry, she got on the waiting list when she was pregnant with her first daughter. By the time she got off the waiting list and got the voucher, her daughter was eight years old. And this is not an uncommon story. But despite the wait, Edie was thrilled. She read up on all the rules. She learned she could use her voucher basically anywhere. She was really excited to move to the county, which in Baltimore means the suburbs, uh, Baltimore City, Baltimore County. And she had always dreamed of living in an area called Owings Mills and having more trees around. But when she went to visit homes in the suburbs, landlords turned her away, repeatedly telling her, we don't accept vouchers here. And actually Maryland has since passed a law preventing this kind of discrimination, at least in theory. But um, at the time of my research, there was no such law. And in most places in the country, there is no such law protecting voucher holders in this way. So landlords are perfectly within their rights in most places to turn voucher holders down. Now, um, despite not being able to really move where she wanted to go, the voucher nevertheless changed her life. It offered her stability, a better quality house. She's free from the worry she had about where she and her daughter will end up. Um, but she didn't have a ton uh, of say uh, in where that actually was. She just knows she has a home. Now, in the next part of the book, I start to look at why people don't have as much choice as we would hope. 
And of course, previous work has looked at the role of limited affordable housing, right? The geography of housing supply, while other research has focused on residential preferences, um, positing that people end up in the segregated neighborhoods in part uh, because of their own preferences. But what I found was that there really was a missing piece here, a key actor who affects residential decisions on this simple and fundamental level that is related to both supply and demand. And that's landlords. And landlords are a really important piece of this puzzle. And while recent research has demonstrated how landlords play a really important role in selecting tenants out through eviction, we know very little about the role landlords play in selecting tenants in, right? How they make decisions about desirable tenant characteristics and their role in sorting neighborhood, sorting renters across the city. What I quickly realized was that I just couldn't tell this story about voucher holders and where they ended up and why without also telling the story of their landlords. So chapter five opens with an anecdote about David, who's a landlord who stands outside the Baltimore voucher office to actually try to recruit voucher tenants on their way out the door. So on any given day of the week, you can find landlords like David waiting there, offering to drive tenants up to the vacant units, offering incentives like customizing the paint color, waiving the security deposit, which as you can imagine is a really big deal for a voucher holder. If you're having trouble paying your rent, how are you gonna come up with a full month's rent and security deposit? There are sometimes programs that help voucher holders, but it's not a standard part of the program. So if a, if a landlord offers to waive the security deposit, that can be a really big sway for a voucher holder. Um, landlords like David even offer move-in cash bonuses um, as much as a couple hundred dollars or even, again, a full month's rent um, in cash as sort of a, a reward for, for moving into this home. <clears throat> oh, one and, more a, yeah. a question. You can yeah. take, take a sip of water and I'll ask the question. Um, Becca Shwai is curious, when someone has a voucher and has found housing that will take it, are there any restrictions on them being able to just to move to another housing at a different point if the new landlord would also take the voucher? I mean, are they just as mobile, I guess is the question. So, <clears throat> sorry for my <clears throat> throat today. They are, um, they are bound by the terms of their lease like any renter. And so if they have a year lease, they can't just break the terms of the lease without um, a particular reason to do so. But, you know, they have uh, valid reasons like any other renter, like if there's a housing quality pro uh, problem that the landlord hasn't taken care of, then certainly they can do that. It is a little bit more complicated because <clears throat> essentially in order to use the voucher you have at a new property, <clears throat> technically speaking, you actually have to apply for, you actually have to get a new voucher. It doesn't mean you have to wait on the waiting list again, but you have to be technically issued a new voucher and you have to enter into a new contract between yourself, your landlord and the housing authority. And so there is a bit of an administrative process here that certainly for low income people, um, for anyone you can imagine, um, it's just an, you know, an added administrative task that might make that difficult and, and um, is probably not uh, not unrelated to the fact that many voucher holders, when they get their voucher, they end up leasing in place. They end up using their voucher um, in the unit that they're already in or in the neighborhood that they're already in because that's the easiest thing to do if their landlord will accept it. But in theory, you can use your voucher um, at any um, in any property where the landlord is willing to accept it, where the landlord has passed an inspection and where the rent qualifies within the payment standard for the housing voucher. <clears throat> so the reason why uh, landlords stand outside the voucher office in this way is that voucher tenants are very desirable in this neighborhood. And this might seem counterintuitive to those of you who have heard about a lot of stigma from the program. And certainly there is stigma around the program, especially in more advantaged neighborhoods. But in disadvantaged neighborhoods like Park Heights, finding and attracting tenants who are able to pay their rent reliably is not an easy task. So a basic fact for landlords in Baltimore, and especially again in this neighborhood, is that many low-income renters simply can't afford to pay their rent. They are too rent burdened. And this provides an incentive for landlords to entice voucher holders to their vacant units, since a big chunk of the voucher holder's rent is paid, again, directly by the housing authority, directly to the landlord. So one of my landlords that I spoke to, Oscar, he explains this, he says, Everybody prefers Section 8. It's tough times now. If the tenant doesn't pay the mortgage, you have to. 
uh, section eight ensures that you're going to get your money. So it's really a safeguard for landlords. By assuring reliable rent, this program thus appeals to a particular segment of landlords who have now oriented their businesses towards attracting and retaining voucher holders. And this is not something I figured out until I literally saw the landlords standing outside the voucher office and try to figure out why they would be doing that. Um, they also do it because they can sometimes get a premium above market rate. So in a neighborhood like Park Heights, landlords report that they can sometimes get as much as several hundred dollars more um, from a voucher holder per month than they could from a market tenant. And that's because the voucher payment standards in Baltimore are set at the metropolitan level, not at the neighborhood level. And, you know, Baltimore is a poor city, but some of the suburbs surrounding Baltimore are some of the richest counties in the country, right? If you think about what Maryland looks like. Now, this set of practices, waiting outside the office, offering move-in bonuses, this falls into a category of targeting tactics that landlords use to entice tenants to their properties in neighborhoods like Park Heights, where again, they have trouble attracting tenants or trouble attracting tenants who can pay reliably. And this results in a sort of predatory inclusion where voucher holders are not making meaningful choices about where to live, but rather are being lured into some less than ideal neighborhoods where they probably wouldn't otherwise end up. At the same time, um, at, the, at the level of the metropolitan area, there is also exclusion from more affluent neighborhoods. So outside of Park Heights, the program is highly stigmatized and landlords frequently discriminate against voucher tenants. Some landlords are outright racist, others know that their tenants are, and so they worry about the voucher tenants sort of upsetting the neighbors, quote. Now, most cities and states, as I said, don't have adequate legal protections for voucher holders. There's no national source of income protection law preventing a landlord from discriminating against a voucher holder in the way that there is one related to race, gender, religious background, right? These are all protected classes under the Fair Housing Act. Source of income, i.e. paying your rent with a voucher, is not a protected class at the federal level. Because landlords' motives are aligned with their bottom line, not necessarily um, with the greater good, we see this dual trend of inclusion and exclusion, which contributes to patterns of segregation. Due to all this, a lack of legal protections for voucher holders, the persistence of racial discrimination and the role of landlords, I think it's fair to say that choice among voucher holders remains largely a fiction. The potential is there. And, and I should note that voucher holders themselves do feel like they're making choices because compared to the utter lack of choices that they had previously, they're making some choices, but they're certainly not realizing the full potential of the choice that the program is intended to provide. All of this really points to the failure of the system to provide real, full, informed choices to tenants without adding extra programming, which when we get to the policy section, I will talk about and will recommend. Now, chapter six is about the neighborhood into which voucher holders are moving and how they're actually received in this neighborhood. So one of the ideas used to justify the transition to the voucher program is the idea that, as I talked about at the beginning, neighborhoods matter for life outcomes. So in contrast to public housing, where people really had no choice but to live in neighborhoods where public housing was located, and these were neighborhoods with really few resources, really, um, really high crime often, in contrast to public housing, policymakers have come to hope that voucher holders might be able to access new neighborhoods, and especially new neighbors people who might connect them to jobs and other resources. And this is of course what sociologists call social capital, the set of tools and information that your social networks can impart to you. And part, given Parkite's history as a large homeowning community, we might expect that existing residents have lots of resources to impart to newcomers. And even with less of the racial animosity that we would expect in, in a white neighborhood. But I did, not, I did not find this to be the case. When I looked at what I'm calling the neighborhood receiving context, the social dynamics between old timers and newcomers, the way in which the voucher is stigmatized, I found that homeowners weren't letting voucher holders into their social networks. In fact, they were actively excluding them. So mere proximity to social capital was not enough. 
Park Heights is a neighborhood that is quite fragile in itself. The homeowners who moved there were victims of predatory housing schemes, redlining, blockbusting, etc. And now they're quite protective of what little they have left, and they perceive voucher holders to be a threat to their home values. What's more, community organizations are not helping to bridge this divide. While there are a number of organizations in the neighborhood, improvement associations, healthcare, community groups, they tend to serve homeowners and renters separately, really reifying these differences. So the best example I have of this was that I had been regularly going to a community meeting and happened to mention it to one of the uh, renters in the in the um, in the housing voucher in I say housing voucher complex. It was a regular private market complex that happened to have a lot of voucher holders for all the reasons that I've been telling you about. Um, and I mentioned it to one of the residents there, and she was really excited. She did not know there was a community meeting. It was literally like a block and a half around the corner from where she lived, and so she was really excited to come come with me. But when she got there, um, she and sort of heard the concerns that were being talked about on the different topics that came up, things like crime control, um, uh, weatherproofing your house, installing security cameras in your house. These were all topics that were really geared and oriented towards homeowners. If you're a renter, you're not spending money to weatherproof your house and you're not installing security system in, in your apartment. Um, <clears throat> and so she sort of shrugged at me and said, you know, this meeting is really for, for middle-class folks is what she said. Um, and it was something I hadn't fully realized um, until she pointed it out to me. But, you know, this, this is an opportunity. It could be an opportunity to bring people together to actually talk about neighborhood issues that involve um, people of all different backgrounds and classes and homeownership statuses. Um, and yet it, it really wasn't. And it, it really, uh, in particularly in that week that she happened to come, it, it really happened to be much more focused on homeowners. So there's sort of a lost opportunity there. Lastly, I'll tell you about something that I think is a key feature of vouchers. One of the women I got to know, uh, Vivian, who moved to Park Heights with her voucher um, and with the stable home that it provided, was able to regain custody of her twin boys. I mentioned Vivian before. So Vivian really said that she liked the neighborhood. She said she felt safe there, especially compared to some of the places she had spent the night when she was homeless. Uh, but when Vivian's husband was killed <clears throat> in a street mugging, she decided she wanted to move. She told me, I just want a new place to live. You know, I just want to feel safe. And the voucher was the only thing that allowed her to do this. So without the voucher, she likely would have been stuck where she was. And the flexibility to move to escape violence or for a new job or to get your kid into a new school, right? To be closer to, to your child's school. This, is, this ability, this flexibility is something that middle-class families I think frequently take for granted. The voucher holders I got to know felt that their voucher was liberating. Even if from the outside, we can see that that choice is very circumscribed, that landlords are really getting in the way it's important to hear when people say that the voucher changed their lives and that it provided them with choices that they felt they've never had before. So in conclusion, <clears throat> this book is about the important role that neighborhoods play in life outcomes, but also the underexamined role that housing policy itself plays. It's a story about how a federal program meant to address some of the failings of public housing is in turn repeating many of the problems of housing policies past. That said, the policy provides homes for millions of households and it has the potential to do more. I think with some key reforms, vouchers could work better to reduce the undue influence of landlords in the process and to provide families not just with a roof over their head, but also with some choice in where they live. And so, so to that end, I'll talk just a little bit about policy. Um, some of the key policy implications that flow from this work um, and some of the ways in which we could actually make the program better. And, and most of these are, are not things I've thought up or invented myself. There's actually quite a robust conversation around how to make housing vouchers better. But what I've tried to do is really use the research and the on the ground um, insights to um, inform which of these policies I think are, are most important um, and, and really to motivate some of these policies. So first I wanna say, um, let's not 
throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So vouchers do tremendous work to keep people stably housed. And the program really should be expanded to everyone who needs it. This is something Biden has proposed to do in his housing program. He's talked about universal vouchers. He's talked about um, the importance of housing as a right. We are, I think, still quite far from housing being a right. Um, and it, it is still quite unclear um, how, when, or if um, he will make good on that plan. But it, it does seem to be something that he's willing to talk about and think about. And importantly, I think that expansion could also help to reduce stigma. Um, uh, right now, the voucher program has assumed a lot of the stigma that public housing had. Certainly, this was one of the key findings of my work. And in theory, right, expanding the program to everyone who needs it could really help to, to reduce that, uh, that stigma because it would be much more common. Um, it could also even push developers to create more affordable housing, which, of course, would be one of the biggest challenges with ramping a program like this up. That being said, um, the book really does point to some key concerns about scaling up um, that we should be pretty pretty worried about um, if we don't address some of the some of the flaws in this program. So most importantly, I think that we need to shore things up on the tenant side to mitigate landlord influence, which is um, not, you know, the, the landlord's interests are just not always the same. In fact, they're usually not the same as the tenant's best interest. So for one, we need to provide better information and counseling about um, to, to families directly about where they can move. And mobility programs offer us a lot of insight here. There's been just a ton of research, especially in recent years on MTO, on the follow-up to MTO, um, on uh, Gautreau, on um, the Thompson program in Baltimore that looks specifically about the importance of counseling and the importance of just helping families figure out what their options even are um, so that they, they know that they have options and that they don't only have to move to neighborhoods they already know, that there might be other places too that they haven't thought about, that they don't have networks in, but that might be places where they can find jobs and provide for their families. So um, counseling has been shown to be really, really important. And this doesn't have to be a heavy handed paternalistic counseling uh, telling people where to live. It can be purely informational, offering resources and help. Um, and in particular, offering things like transportation um, so that if someone wants to visit a new place, they have the ability to do so. Um, and also offering things like security deposit assistance. So the example I gave with the landlords waiving the security deposit, that can be a really, really strong enticement for someone to move to a place that they wouldn't otherwise want to move to simply because they know they don't have to worry about the security deposit. And so if we were able to provide people with security deposits, then we wouldn't be relying on the landlords to fill that gap. And then the landlords using that offer um, as a way to influence where tenants end up. There are also several policy-wide changes that could and I think should be made. Um, the first one is extending the period of time that is allotted to use the voucher. Um, this would mean that families who don't phone, find a home in time um, wouldn't be at risk of losing their voucher. Um, and the last time we have data on this was in 2001. And in tight housing markets, it's something close to a third of voucher holders that end up um, having to give their voucher back because they were not able to find a home within the allotted time period, even with extensions. And it's usually a 60 day period. In some places it's 90, often you can go up to 120, but even with those extensions, we find that a large number of voucher holders are simply unable to find a home in time with their voucher. Um, and so extending the period of time um, is really, really crucial. Um, in that vein, it's also really important to make source of income protection laws um, federal. So um, source of income protection laws are not a cure-all. Uh, just two days ago, there was a big scandal in DC where one of the largest property owners, um, someone put on Twitter a flyer that was found saying that they don't accept voucher holders, which is against the law in DC. So you can, you can immediately sort of start to imagine how um, a law like this, unless it's really, really strongly enforced, um, might have folks um, just breaking the law. Um, and in this case, the, the property owner said that it was a mistake and they had, they had just worded it wrong, which may or may not be true. But at the end of the day, you know, it's very easy, I think, for property managers to go ahead and break the law in that way or insinuate to tenants that they don't accept voucher holds, holders. Um, so it, it's really important, I think, um, to recognize that 
a source of income protection law is not foolproof, but the research on SOI laws has shown that they do make a difference. They don't completely change everything, but they make a difference and they benefit tenants. And I think paired with some strong enforcement, um, they could really, really help. Um, and finally, um, thinking about small area fair market rents. So as I've sort of talked about, um, the payment standards for vouchers are set at, uh, at or around the FMR. And um, the FMR is based on the area median rent, which is typically based on a very large metropolitan area. But if we can base these on more um, local rents, for example, by zip code, which is um, a program that was implemented, was passed in 2016, it was implemented in 2018 in a select number of cities. Um, what that does is it basically calibrates, calibrates rents more locally in order to sort of eliminate this premium that I talked about that exists in Park Heights. Um, this is a tricky thing to do in Baltimore, um, which is why it actually hasn't been yet implemented in Baltimore, because the rents in the city are so depressed relative to the suburbs that if we localize the payment standards, um, then, then, then those payment standards would actually go down across the entire city. And so that could be problematic. But there are ways to get around this. I'm happy to talk more about it if anyone wants to nerd out on small area FMRs. But um, there's more work to be done to figure out how to implement a policy like this in Baltimore. But it's something that has really worked, for example, in D.C., where, um, where your voucher um, is worth more in the Georgetown neighborhood than it is in the Eckington neighborhood. So your, your voucher goes up to $3,000 dollars in Georgetown and I think it only goes up to around 1700 in Eckington for a one or two bedroom. So really big difference and that's because those housing markets are very different. So finally I want to highlight that there are limits to the voucher system. Um, vouchers don't work for everyone. The hardest to house families may need, may need additional housing support. And investing in tenant-based solutions does not absolve us from investing in disadvantaged neighborhoods directly, which should happen in tandem with vouchers. And Park Heights is a perfect example of why this, why this matters, right? Um, the neighborhood has needs too um, that we should be addressing, not ignoring. Um, and I think it's really important too to not, uh, to not ask one program to do everything, right? There's a lot of criticisms we can make of the voucher program, and I make many of them, but I also think it's not equipped to do everything. We shouldn't be asking it to be a neighborhood revitalization tool. We have other programs that do that um, and that are much better equipped to do that. Um, so that's all on policy. Thank you guys so much, and I'm happy to take any questions or or, um, or elaborate on any parts of this. I just <clears throat> presented a lot of book in a relatively short amount of time. So um, I'm gonna stop the share for a minute so I can see you. And I apologize, it looks like my video was frozen for a little while. Hi there. Um, as sometimes happens, I got a phone call I need to take, but I'm going to ask you Lois's uh, question. I'm going to ask you two questions in a row so you can answer them, um, and then I'll hop on, on and off my phone call. Um, so the first question is from Lois, which is, why is the number of Section 8, vouchers, Section 8 vouchers so limited? Is this from underfunding or something else? And then Tom Stanley Becker would like to hear more about racial discrimination and um, also about criminal history in terms of a protected class. Um, so I'm gonna leave you to answer those and I'll be right back. Sure. So this is usually the first question I get about vouchers. Why aren't there more of them? Um, and there's no great answer except to say that historically as a country, we have never committed to housing as a right. We have never committed really even to helping people all that much with their housing needs. Um, you know, there was urban renewal in the mid-century and there was public housing built in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, and there was some sense there that it was sort of meant to clear out the slum and help people get out of poverty. But I think it was very much also motivated by a desire to take that land <laughs> that, that, the, that the slums and that the tenements were located in and to, um, and to sort of clean up those areas. And so I, I think we sort of have to be realistic about history and realize that like it was only partly humanitarian and that, and, and this is something 
Kiyaga Yamata Taylor writes about a lot as well, this idea that like as a country, we've just never committed to the idea that our government should provide housing for the poor. And so there has never been enough subsidies for the poor, but more basically, there has never been enough affordable housing for the poor. So the reason why we need housing vouchers and public housing is because the private market has not provided affordable housing at the levels at which we need it. And so public housing and other kinds of subsidies and, and Section 8, right, come in to sort of bridge that gap and help people afford their homes. Um, but um, but we have failed on all fronts, right? We have failed on housing production. We have failed on housing preservation. We have failed on housing subsidies. Um, and so I sometimes flip that question around and say, well, why would we expect there to be enough vouchers? Um, we wouldn't. We wouldn't expect it because we have never we have never made that commitment. Um, we provide food stamps to everyone who needs them. Um, you know, there are other kinds of programs that that um, that are in, uh, entitlement programs, but um, but even cash assistance is no longer provided to everyone who needs it on a on an unqualified basis. So um, I think I think that that's maybe maybe the right way to think about it. Um, we have seen an increase in vouchers and. That is largely because, as I talked about, as sort of people recognized the limitations and, and failures in some way with public housing, we took that money and converted it to vouchers. But the, um, there haven't been huge expansions um, in the actual budget that we dedicate to housing um, in a long time. And um, we may be in for a change. Biden certainly more than anyone, any other president we've had has, has talked about doing that. Um, but um, I'm not holding my breath, <laughs> so we'll see. Um, the second question, discrimination. Um, I see it in the chat here. So when it comes to racial discrimination, I think one of the things that, that gets happened, especially in a city like Baltimore, <clears throat> where um, the voucher program is over 90% African-American, is that voucher status and race become sort of conflated. So a lot of landlords, especially those who had properties in whiter neighborhoods would say to me, well, I can't take a voucher holder in Canton because, because my white tenants in Canton would leave. Um, and what they meant by that was if I, if I put a black person in my property in Canton, my white tenants are so racist. And they would say, I'm not racist, but my tenants are racist. All of that is debatable, but either way, right? Race is factoring in, in this really important way where um, because racism still exists and it is so virulent, um, and because there is conf this conflation of voucher status with race, um, it sort of serves to perpetuate these very patterns where landlords, they don't really want to be the ones doing the racial integration. Like they don't really see that as their role. And I can understand that on some level. Um, uh, and it's true that, you know, they, di they didn't, they didn't themselves cause the racism, but I, I do think their choices are absolutely perpetuating it and, and sort of uh, replicating these patterns. Um, when it comes to criminal history discrimination, um, so criminal history is not a protected class, um, generally speaking. There was a, I, I believe it is called a ruling that was passed at the end of the Obama administration that sort of, um, and, and certain places like DC has has certain statutes around how landlords are allowed to con to consider criminal history, um, and so, but it's not technically a protected class, and so any kind of ruling that is made is more of like a suggestion. So in DC, for example, landlords are not supposed to do a criminal background check until the second stage, so they're supposed to make their determination based on credit and based on. Um, sort of like income, right? All the sort of standard legal ways in which you make a decision about a tenant. And then <clears throat> if um, and then if, if the tenant passes that stage, then they're allowed to go and do a criminal history check. And then they're not supposed to deny the person based on a criminal history, unless they have reason to think that the person poses like a substantial threat of violence to existing tenants. Um, that's tricky. I don't, that's, that's really murky waters for me. Um, as far as as how that's related to vouchers specifically, um, which maybe is what the question is getting at. Um, it's very complicated. There are some federal laws, but then individual PHAs also set um, 
also set regulations around what kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, what kind of criminal history might disqualify you from, from a voucher. So that, that, that actually varies quite a bit. Thanks. I'm, I'm back. Um, and the questions have been piling in. So let me, let me do my job um, and ask them to you. So Hans uh, would like to know what chair people who newly receive a voucher stay in place, apply the voucher to the unit that they're already in. So not using um, the voucher to go get a new unit, but they have, they're in a unit that they're struggling to pay and they just use the voucher for that. Yeah, it's it's I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it is because it it, it varies so much from place to place. Um, and I, I don't want to mix up DC and Baltimore, but it's some substantial portion um, that that do that some some very not, uh, I would say less than half, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess around 30%. But I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. But that is quite a quite common outcome. Um, and, and is contrary to what sort of policymakers hoped would happen. Um, and I'll, I'll make the plug for you. Is that number in your book? Yes, it's definitely in the book. <laughs> so Hans, if you buy the book or read the book, <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll get the number. Um, Becca Shry would like to know um, if you can talk more about the local market rents and how to make sure that rents are reflective of the quality of the housing and the services accessible in the neighborhood. Yeah, great question. So when it comes to the quality of the actual house, um, voucher homes, uh, homes that qualify for voucher holders do have to go through a yearly inspection. And so in theory, um, they are, and, and certainly in my experience, they were of better quality than the homes of the tenants who didn't have a voucher, but a lot can happen in a year, especially with a home that has been renovated, but very, very cheaply, right? Things break. And so if you're only having a yearly inspection, sometimes things can get pretty bad before the next inspection. Um, when it comes to setting the rent, there's something called rent reasonableness, which is basically the process that HUD outlines all jurisdictions have to do, although every jurisdiction, again, does it a little bit differently. And you'll find with a lot of these questions, sometimes they're so hard to answer because they vary tremendously because there's a federal set of rules that, get, that then get interpreted um, in a wide variety of ways. But in Baltimore, um, with rent reasonableness, there is a whole checklist of items related, of course, to things like bedroom size, but also to amenities. Is there a dishwasher? Is there a washer and dryer? Is there a backyard? Right, things that, um, that might make the, um, make, the rent, uh, make the rent ceiling or the payment standard a little bit higher. And you'll see landlords try to manipulate those. They'll put in a dishwasher because they know they can then charge 50 bucks more a month if they do that. Um, so rent reasonableness is meant to be a check so that when, um, when the inspector comes in and when HUD is making this contract and negotiating the rent with the landlord, so the landlord asks for a certain amount of rent that is within the payment standard. And then, and then the PHA comes back and says, well, you know, we think it's worth this or that. And they negotiate. Um, and rent reasonableness is meant to sort of provide comps with units nearby in the neighborhood that, um, that have similar amenities and that should go for a similar price. The problem, of course, if you know anything about real estate is that once you have one comp, even if it's a bad comp, you can use that comp to ask for a particular amount of rent. And so, um, and so things get, get wonky pretty quickly. Um, and, and because the housing authority is very, very interested in getting landlords on board so that there are enough homes for their tenants to rent, I think they often do more negotiating than, than they should. Um, Catherine, remind me how much time we have so I don't spend. We have another 15 time. minutes. So oh, that's that said, we still have more questions. So, <laughs> but you're doing well. You're doing well. Okay. Okay. Uh, next so, question. Uh, did I answer that full question? It was about rent. It was about physical characteristics and. and, and rent oh, oh, the other part of the yeah. Yeah. So, so I will say that they don't take neighborhood characteristics into account as much as they could or should. And again, this is in part because the neighborhoods, I mean, this is a little bit of a leap for me to say in that I haven't interviewed very many housing authority officials, but um, I've interviewed a few. And um, again, the places where landlords want to rent to tenants are in the neighborhoods where they're having trouble renting to market rate tenants, where they're having trouble attracting other people. So if you, if you disqualify those neighborhoods because they have high levels of vacancies or something, you end up with not very much stock left um, in which voucher holders can actually find a place to live. So, you know, 
that makes it really tricky. This is something that calibrating rents more locally would help because if voucher holders had more money to use in more expensive neighborhoods, then they could actually access those neighborhoods. Um, but often with a limited budget, when you're talking about increasing the amounts in some neighborhoods, you may be talking about having less vouchers in order to, um, in order to allow for more money um, for mobility. And so we see that sort of basic aid in terms of getting people housed at all is sometimes to some degree um, at odds with providing mobility for people. Um, and that's where and when, that's where the mobility wars really, really start is people, some people saying, no, we should just provide homes no matter where they are. And other people saying, no, how can we use a federal program to house people in neighborhoods that are not helping them? Um, and there's, there's a real tension there. Um, just uh, to further that tension, I'm going to jump ahead in the queue to Adiba's question. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that there are abandoned houses, you know, abandoned, mm -hmm. abandoned housing stock, um, sort of who owns those and how did they figure into, you know, people being unhoused and unaccessible, inaccessible housing? Yeah, great question. It's, it's always really confusing to be in a city um, where there's a lot of vacancies and also a lot of homelessness or a lot of, you know, unaffordability. Um, and it, it seems like it should be a, an easy answer to solve and often it's not. And I always think about taking my dad to Baltimore for the first time and driving down North Avenue, which is like a pretty big street that has these, you know, beautiful sort of Victorian townhomes that are just in shambles. Um, and many, many of them are abandoned. And I remember driving down and showing him and saying, dad, look at all these abandoned homes. And he said, oh no, they're not abandoned. And they're, they're being fixed. I was like, no, they're not. It was like this, this sort of lens that I think one has when one spends a lot of time in a city where everything does get fixed and there aren't a lot of vacancies. It was like impossible for him to believe that these homes were just sitting there empty and that no one was doing anything. Um, and to answer your question, a lot of the time they were owned by a homeowner, you know, who passed on and the, and the home is now jointly owned by like three of this person's, you know, adult children who live in different cities. And so they, you know, they have the intention to do something with the home, but they live far away and it's worth so little, you know, it's worth like $30,000 or something that they're sort of like, well, it's a bigger pain for us to actually deal with fixing up this home and selling it than it is to just let it sit there. And so a lot of the time, that is the story with those older homes that are that are sort of abandoned. There are other cases where it is owned by a bank or it is owned by an absentee landlord who intends to do something with it, but hasn't done much with it. And, and of course, remember too, that I was there in 2011, which was only a few years after the housing crisis. So a lot of people probably had intentions um, and, um, and, and weren't really able to carry them out at that time. The city of Baltimore has a huge sort of vacancy program where they are trying to tear down homes that are truly vacant and that are uninhabitable and, and dangerous from a point of view of fire or from a point of view of someone trying to enter the house and it being structurally unsound. And um, during the time that I was there, there were a couple of really, really, um, sort of public incidents. There was one incident where a man was sitting in his car in front of an abandoned home, just talking on his cell phone and the home collapsed and I believe killed him in his car. So things like that, where it just really brought attention to the issue of like, this is a problem. Like you can't just let these, these homes sit here. Um, that being said, the level of vacancy is nowhere near on the order of, of a city like Detroit. So it's sort of, um, it's 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 a problem, but it's it's not as big a problem as in some places. Um, another question, different topic from Min Sion. Uh, extending the expiration data, I think they mean date, but expiration data sounds really like a low-hanging fruit. Has there been yeah. any pushback against that? Um, again, so I'm assuming that this means um, the time period in which the voucher holder has to use their voucher, if I'm hearing yeah. this right. Um, uh, there hasn't, I, I think, I think the counter argument to it is of course that there are so many people on the waiting list. There's so many people who want this voucher. And I think from a more 
politically conservative point of view, what you say is, well, why aren't these people trying harder to get homes? And I think if you're not aware of some of the barriers that voucher holders face, it's really easy to say, well, if they're not gonna use it, give it to someone who wants it. So that, that would be the counter argument. I don't tend to subscribe to that because I feel that the barriers are so high to leasing up that, um, that anyone who you give that voucher to is gonna face those barriers. So once a person has sort of dug in and started trying, it makes sense to me to give them a little bit longer um, to go ahead and use it, but that would be the counter argument. Great. Um, Becca Shry is interested in whether the program works differently or has different outcomes in rural areas. That's a great question. And I, I haven't studied it much in rural areas. Um, I think that you tend to see housing, you tend to see many more housing vouchers in areas that have large public housing authorities. Um, so the number of vouchers that would be available in a small public, in a, in a rural area would be very, very few. And so it's not something that has been um, all that studied, but um, uh, but if we were to expand vouchers, that would be a really important question, I think, is to figure out, like, is this a program that would well, work well in those contexts? And certainly in markets where you have rent, less rental housing, which I, I would think would be the case in more uh, rural areas, um, you may expect some of these barriers actually to be even, even higher, perhaps. <clears throat> Um, another question. Uh, Mallory says she's curious about the extent to which you found voucher holders caught between wanting to help extended family or fictive kin with housing, housing informally in terms of doubling up or something, and then housing voucher restrictions. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, um, so with the housing voucher, you are technically only allowed to have adults in the home who are, um, who are actually on the lease. <clears throat> and so, um, and so I think that's a tension that voucher holders face often where <clears throat> they either want to help family members or they need family members help, right? They need their mom who's offering them childcare <clears throat> to be in the house so that, so that she can help. And there are, there are cases where you can get that person on the lease, but if that person is making money, then putting them on the lease will of course affect how much your voucher is worth and how much you have to pay. Um, and I've also seen people struggle with this as their teenage children um, get older and become adults. If their teenage children have jobs, then their teenage children's incomes count um, as income and reduces the overall value of the voucher. So that's a really big tension too. Okay. Um, a uh, question about um, people who move. So I, I guess not people that move with a voucher, but people that are maybe on the waiting lists. So what happens if you have to move from one city to another to get a job or take an opportunity or some such thing? Yeah, great question. So, um, and, and part of the problem with the waiting lists is that of course, because it takes so many years to get off the waiting list, by the time someone's name pops up, most of the time, they're not living in the same place that they were living in. Their phone number may have changed. Who knows, even their email may have changed, right? Things change over the course of eight years. Um, they may live in an entirely different city. So um, one of the big problems and, and one of the reasons why waiting lists have become um, so inefficient is that it takes a really long time to pull up a name and then to actually be able to get in touch with the person whose name you pull up. Um, so technically vouchers are portable, which means that if you live in Baltimore and you get a voucher, you can use it in California, technically. Um, there's a process called porting where it gets ported out to the new housing authority. And that authority, that authority can either absorb the voucher or sort of let Baltimore keep paying for it, but sort of administer it through the new housing authority. It's as complicated as it sounds. It's not easy for tenants to navigate and it's a pain in the butt for, for housing authorities to navigate. Um, now, like what exactly would happen if your name came up and you had moved to a new city? As long as they could get in touch with you, I think you could still get that voucher and you would have to port it to wherever you were. But the details of that too are gonna really vary a lot um, by housing authority. Great, thank you. So um, I wanna congratulate you on your book and then ask you, because uh, all academics are greedy, well, what is coming next? What do you think are the next questions to be answered and what new projects should we be paying attention and looking forward to uh, your work from? Yeah, great question. Um, so one of the things I've actually been working on 
since shortly after sort of finishing the field work for this is a study of landlords, um, you know, primarily about landlords. And so this is a, a mixed method study based on about 160 interviews um, and also all of the HUD administrative data following all of the landlords who participate in the voucher program as well as the tenants that they house. Um, and this is in four cities. So it's in Baltimore and then DC where I am now, and then also two rather different cities, um, which are Dallas, Texas and Cleveland, Ohio. And so this study really looks at sort of from the landlord perspective, trying to understand how and why do landlords participate in housing programs more broadly, sort of how do landlords get into the business of landlording? How do they think about their role as providers of affordable housing? Um, I have a paper under review now that I have fingers crossed on that is about um, racial discrimination and sort of really explicitly like how do landlords think about the race of their tenants? How do they, um, how does it factor into their decision-making process? Um, so, so there will be a book probably in a few years about uh, once I catch my breath from this one um, with, <laughs> with my co-author um, Phil Garboden, who's at the University of Hawaii. We will, we we have sort of just started um, the writing for a book uh, about landlords and the affordable housing market more broadly. So, trying to sort of say, look, we we talk a lot about housing, we talk a lot about tenants, but we're we're missing um, we're missing this key player um, who, you know, really affects tenants outcomes but also like affects our affects the housing supply right like shapes the housing market in these very important ways that that i think we've we've really ignored for a long time well that sounds uh excellent exciting um and we look forward to having you and or philip back uh to talk about that book when it's done or, or that work when it's done um, so let me thank you. Uh, that was a great hour and a half and you answered lots of questions and um, I hope you get a chance to give your voice a quick rest before whatever comes next <laughs> today. But we uh, look forward to staying in touch and hearing more about your work in the future. Thank you thank so much. Thank you all for being here. Um, great questions and it was a pleasure to talk to you all. Thank you. Take care. Bye everyone.